Hey everyone, I'm sure you've all seen the images or videos that NASA posted of the shockwaves generated by one or a pair of T-38s in flight. In this video, I'll be walking you through, step by step, how to take these kinds of images at home and process the images to get something that looks like the ones taken by the pros. A few years ago, I made a video about how to make your own Schlieren system at home. To get nice images or videos from that system, you needed a high quality mirror, which is not always easy to find, and when you do find one, it might be quite expensive. The method in this video is called Background Oriented Schlieren, or BOSS for short. I'm not going to go into the math behind BOSS, but here's a quick explain like I'm five version of it. Let's say you're looking at a tree in the distance, and there's nothing between you and the tree. It looks like a normal tree. Now let's say you decide to make something on your grill, so you fire it up and take a step back and enjoy that view of the tree again. But now you notice that it looks distorted and kind of wavy. This is because there is now a density gradient, or index of refraction gradient, that the light rays from the tree need to pass through before getting to your eyes, and so they get bent and distorted along the way. We're going to take advantage of that distortion, or what looks like a shift of the pixels on our camera. While you can generally see boss signals when the gradients are strong enough, the code used in boss processing allows us to see much smaller gradients as well. In addition to this video, I have an extensive document that goes through everything I talk about here, so if you'd like to read at your own pace, you can go ahead and download it from my website. Let's go over a quick outline of what's covered in this video. First, we'll go over the programs that we'll need. You can do everything in this video with free programs, so anyone will be able to do this at home. I also have code in MATLAB for those that want to use that. Next, we'll cover how to use FFmpeg to convert videos from one form to another. Downloaded YouTube videos and my phone's videos, my Samsung S6, are in the MP4 format, and videos from my DSLR camera are in MOV format. To load into ImageJ for further processing, we will need these to be in AVI format. Then, we'll pre-process our videos and images in ImageJ. We will go over how to work with stacks and images, cropping, image registration, which is just a fancy way of saying image alignment, and using macros to speed up our workflow for repetitive tasks. Now we can get to the code. I have both MATLAB and Python code that I'll be showing. They have mostly the same exact functionality, but MATLAB has a little bit more. The code can be found at my website or GitHub with links in the video description. I'll be using the NASA Airboss images as the example. Finally, we can take our own images at home and use the previous steps to analyze our data. First, I'll show you the programs that I use and where to download them. I'll be using FFmpeg for the video conversion. Then I'll be using ImageJ, or more specifically Fiji, uh, which is just ImageJ for the image and video processing. I'll just be calling it ImageJ from now on. To perform the boss analysis, I'll be using Python. Uh, as long as you have Python installed, you should be fine. I personally like to use Anaconda, however, which then looks like this after opening. And then I use Spider, which is an IDE for Python, uh, which then looks like this after opening. However, you can just run the code without downloading Anaconda by using the command line. Let's get started with our NASA video processing. I have the video in MP4 format, as you can see in this folder, and I also have ImageJ opened up. So let's try to load the MP4 video into ImageJ by dragging and dropping like this. This opens up uh, this import options dialog. We can just leave the defaults, press OK, and you can see that we get this error. And so uh, instead we can use the AVI reader in ImageJ, so we'll need to convert our video. You can generally just convert videos with a couple commands, as shown on the FFmpeg website. However, we can use a few other commands to make sure we get the best quality and only convert the portion of the video that we want. Here I've opened up the video, and you can see it's a minute long, and scrubbing through... Uh, there's a lot of stuff in this video that we don't necessarily care about for our processing. So we just want the raw images that we can process with our boss code. So from about, I would say, 33 seconds, and if I let this run, to about 43 seconds when the plane gets up to here, this is what we actually want to process and keep and convert to AVI. First, let's open up the command window in the same directory that the video is in. So we can do that by holding down Shift, right-clicking, and then selecting open command window here and this opens up the command window. Now we can use FFmpeg to convert the video so we're going to type in FFmpeg dash I whoops, for the input video and this is the NASA underscore boss dot mp4 using tab to complete then dash SS and this is the starting time and we said that was 33 seconds so we set 33 seconds and then we use dash T and this is the duration which is not 43 seconds it's 10 seconds from the 33 so we get to 43 seconds then we set the pixel format to NV12 and then we set the output file to AVI and then we 
set the compression so that we don't get any losses uh, in the conversion and then we make sure that the codec is copied from the raw video and then we set the output file NASA underscore boss dot AVI I just call it the same thing and we press enter and this only takes a few seconds and now you can see in our folder up here we have the new uh, video file NASA underscore boss but this is an AVI now we can try to load in the AVI file to ImageJ again by dragging and dropping into the ImageJ window and we get this dialog box opening up and we can see that it says first frame last frame so it's showing that there's 301 frames in this video without changing anything in here we can press OK and now you can see that we do in fact get a successful load of the video that we tried to load in so when the file is loaded in through the AVI reader it's loaded in as something called a stack and this stack has 299 slices. This nomenclature will become important later. So you can see that we're on slice 1 of 299. You can also see the resolution uh, and the type and also the size. The first thing we're going to do is change the type from RGB to 8-bit and this just makes sure that it can be successfully loaded into both of my programs. So we'll go up here to the ImageJ window, go to Image, Type, and then just click 8-bit and it converts to 8-bit and it takes a little while depending on how many frames you have but when it's done you can see that it's the same exact thing over here it's just changed to 8-bit and that also significantly reduces the size for reasons that will become more apparent when we go through the image registration let's just say that instead of taking all the 299 slices I just want maybe a hundred slices so how do we do this let's go up here we'll click image stacks tools slice keeper first slice we want to keep as one the last slice as a hundred and the increment as one these default values will be different when you do this and this will actually default to two uh, but we actually want it to be one because we want every single slice then we press OK and this uh, now pops up with this name of the stack so it's the kept stack and you can see that we only have a hundred slices and the last one ends right here so for my code we're going to need to have images and so what we can do is extract these slices as images so let's first try to just save this as a TIFF file so I'm gonna do file save as TIFF and it opens up uh, a dialog so you can save it and we'll just keep the same name like this and it saves it out and if you go here you can see that it's it hasn't saved every single slice as a separate image it has saved it as essentially like a multi-page TIFF file which is not what we want for loading into my programs so the way that we're going to save individual TIFF files uh, from the slices in this stack is to use the Slice Keeper tool again. So making sure this window is selected first, we can go up to Image, Stacks, Tools, Slice Keeper again. And let's just say we want to save the first slice. We can just do 1, 1, 1. Press OK. That opens it up. There's only one slice in here. And if we do File, Save as TIFF again, and again we can just leave that default file name for now now you can see it saves it as its own separate image as you've probably noted this gets extremely tedious if you want to save more than just a couple images out from a stack and so later we're gonna go through a macro that will do all this for you now you might have noticed that this has some text on it and as we scroll through here they give you the final output over here and so we don't want all this in our final images that we export so what we're gonna do is crop this and the way that you can crop this is to use this rectangular selection tool that's by default selected and I'm just gonna draw this box something like this that only includes what we want in this stack and then we can go up to image crop or press control shift X and that just crops the image the way that boss processing works is by comparing the pixels in two images one of the images is what I'll call the reference image which is our tree before we start the grill and the second image is the object image which is our tree after we start the grill so if I zoom in here kinda on the plane and I scroll between a couple frames you can see that the pixels where the shock is are sort of shifting uh, a little bit which is good however what happens when the background which should not be moving is in fact moving as you can see clearly here when I scrub through you can see the background up here which should have no boss signal is shifting uh, well, you end up getting erroneous boss signals, which will likely overshadow your actual boss signal, depending on how much that background moves 
from frame to frame, and this is where image registration comes into play. You can perform image registration in MATLAB and Python, but I'm going to show you how to do it here in ImageJ because it's not quite obvious at first. We will be using a plugin which we can access by going to Plugins, Registration, Correct 3D Drift, and if I click it right now, uh, you get an error message that says cannot register because there's only one time frame. Please check image properties. Uh, and this is where I said that the nomenclature, where I said that we had a stack with 100 slices, comes into play. So based on that error message suggestion, let's go to image properties or press control shift P and it'll bring up this dialog here and you can see that we have a hundred slices but only one frame and that's the time component here and if you follow this note it says C times Z times T must equal a hundred and what we can do is just put one slice do a hundred frames and press OK and it hasn't done anything here but it has changed it so that we have a hundred frames instead of a hundred slices Okay, now the nice thing about using this plugin is that you can select a region of interest to use instead of using the entire image because we don't want to uh, register this image based off of the plane that's moving and the stuff that's happening down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the end slice and I know that nothing's moving above the plane nose. And so essentially I'm going to just select a region of interest around here and that is what we will be registering the image to. Now let's try this plugin again. So we'll go to plugins, registration, correct 3D drift. And now we get a dialog menu that pops up so we don't get any errors anymore. And what you'll need to do for this is to select all three of these. These are just what worked for me in the past. And then we can press OK and it starts running. Now if you start seeing zeros here when this pops up, you might have not changed the type from RGB to 8-bit. So make sure that you are in 8-bit and not RGB because this will not work if you have an RGB image. So now you can see the output from that image registration in a new window here and you can see that there's a black bar at the top and maybe you can see there's a slight one on the left hand side and as I scroll through now we have a black bar on the bottom maybe a slight one on the right hand side and this is just showing that the registration worked. Uh, it's sort of like image stabilization and so if you scroll back and forth uh, you know maybe the background moves a little bit but it's much better than the than what we had previously and so to get rid of that black bar because we don't care about that for our final versions we can just crop this and so I'm gonna crop it based off of the upper edge here and then I'm gonna go to the final one and I'm gonna bring that edge in a little bit like that and again we can go to uh, image crop and this is our final registered stuff that we want to save out. Now because there was quite a bit of effort involved in going from the original image or video file to here, I like to save this out. So I go to File, Save as TIFF, uh, and I like to save this out as uh, the video file and then just registered. So as I mentioned before, if you want to save two images, so a reference and an object image for instance, we can go into Image, Stacks, Tools, Slice Keeper, and we can do you know, maybe the first slice, okay, save that out. We can go back to this one, go to image, uh, stacks, tools, slice keeper, and then take the next slice, press okay, and save each of these out as their individual uh, images into the folder. But this takes a long time, this is tedious. So what we're gonna do is look at a macro that I wrote that I'll make available on my website and GitHub as well and see how to run it. So to edit macros, you have to go to plugins, macros, edit, and it opens up in here. Sometimes it'll actually open up into the plugins folder, so you just need to back out and go to the macros folder. And here is my macro. It's a .ijm file. And so I'm going to double click open that. And so here is the macro that I wrote. So my macro is going to ask you which directory you want to save the output images to. So what I do before I run the macro is I just make a new folder here and I call it frames. So first the macro uh, asks you to select the save directory, which is just the frames directory that we just created. Then it actually runs the slice keeper, and the default is to go from 1 to 5, but if you wanted all of the slices in your stack, you'd type in 100 here. Uh, then down here it runs the slice keeper, converts to 8-bit, uh, converts the stack to images, and then runs through the all the images and saves it out to the desired directory with a certain uh, file name. And then at the end, it'll close all those images, so you don't have to worry about it if you have a uh, hundred images. It's not going to keep a hundred windows open on your computer. So when you try to run the macro, you'll go to Plugins, Macros, 
and you can see that it's called boss save sequence so it shows up here but generally when you download and install uh, Fiji it will not by default show up here what you'll have to do is to go into install and then double click on this and then it'll be uh, and then it'll be active in here and you can go to plugins macros but uh, if you want to have it always be open when you open up uh, a new instance of Fiji then you can go to edit and you can edit something called the startup macros and in here this is where I put in that same boss save sequence macro so that it's always available upon startup so I don't have to install it every single time okay so now that you have the macro available click this window here go to plugins macros and just click this it'll open up the select a save directory and I'm gonna select the frames directory and select then it opens up the slice keeper dialog I'm just gonna go from 1 to 5 in an increment of 1 press OK and you can see they pop up and then they go away and in the frames directory now we have raw underscore 1 all the way to 5 Note that this will close the registered video file, which is why I always save it here, because if you want to do this again, all we need to do is just drag this in, and see, now we have the registered file here, and if I again run this plugin, and I'll do all of them now, if I go to here, I want to go into frames, select, and now if I go all the way to 100, you can see now they're popping up, and then once it gets to 100, it'll start saving them out, and then it'll start deleting them. And then if we go to the frames folder, now you can see we have all 100 in here. Okay, now I know that was a lot of background on ImageJ and, and pre-processing to get ready for the boss stuff, but uh, you can use all this methodology for all videos and images that you take on your camera. So first we're going to start with the Python code, and you can see it here. And it's extensively commented, so if you have any questions, you can probably find the answer in the comments. And to run it, we'll just press the Run button, or F5, and it brings up the GUI window. And this window looks a little cluttered, but uh, it has four sections. Up here is the loading section, this is the computing section, middle here is the plotting section, and here is just the post-plotting processing section. Now I know I just went through in ImageJ how to get the... Uh, NASA images ready to go for processing and we'll get back to those but just to show you how this GUI works I'm going to use uh, two test images from something called the PIV challenge and so these are the two images here and if I scroll back and forth you can see that there's this uh, rotation that goes uh, clockwise around like this and you can kind of see it better when I when I play this and it jitters okay so first things first we're going to load the images so we can load it by pressing these buttons every button is blue and when it's in use it'll go to black and then when it's done it'll return to blue so here uh, we're gonna load in this first one then we're gonna load in the second one and if you want to show the images after you load them in just to make sure you're loading in the right ones you can check this checkbox and load it in and it'll pop up with the figure now the two most important options in this GUI are the window size and the search size. So for a little more detail into how the boss code works, it essentially breaks up the image into smaller windows uh, called windows in my code. And the window from the object image then gets essentially moved around in relation to the reference image and the most likely shifted position using something called cross correlation is the pixel shift of that window. And so to speed up processing, and since the shifts tend to be pretty small, we can narrow down that searching size in the reference image by something I call the search, and that's this here. The search always needs to be bigger than the window, and I generally keep it at double the window size. Uh, the window size dictates the resolution of your final boss signals, and the search size pretty much speeds up the processing time, since for every window, it doesn't need to search the entire image. So I'm going to leave the window and the search size is the same, and you don't need to worry about these two buttons to start with. I'm just going to press Compute, and you'll see the iterations over here, and that was pretty quick, since these uh, window and search sizes are pretty big. And you can see that it goes all the way to uh, all of the iterations here. And so the next thing we want to do is plot a solution. It hasn't plotted anything yet. And so these checkboxes will plot different things, uh, and you can select multiple at the same time. But first, I'm just going to show you the velocity vectors, which are actually displacement vectors, but I just am too lazy to change this. And so if I just click plot here, now you can see that we get the dots here. The black dots are at the centers of each of the windows. It split up that image into these uh, separate windows. And then at each one of these window centers, it plots the pixel shift. And you can see that we do get that clockwise rotation of the pixels. Instead of the velocity vectors or displacement vectors, we can plot the uh, X displacement. And so you can see that here. And you can see that for a positive value, so these are positive, these are negative. 
uh, positive values in the x direction, this is x displacement, it's going to the right, which makes sense, because it's going around clockwise, and then down here it's going in the negative x direction, which is going left. Now if we plot the y displacement, now you can see again that the more yellow is positive, the more purple is negative, and we know that it's going around clockwise, and, and so you think over here, oh, it's positive, so it's going up, but if you look at the y uh, axis over here, you can see that it's actually going positive is going down. So a positive over here means that it's going down, and we do get that characteristic clockwise rotation. And then the next one we can plot here is the total displacement, and that's just the norm of the uh, x and y displacements. And so this is going around in clockwise, but it's harder to tell with the total displacement. Uh, this just shows the absolute velocity or the magnitude of the velocity vector or displacement vector. So my favorite one is is actually the second one here. And so if we click on this, you see there's a few options. There's the x displacement, y displacement, total displacement, and there's also a transparency or alpha value. And so if we plot this one, you'll end up seeing in the background the original image that you're using, and in the foreground you'll see a transparent plot of whatever you selected in this drop-down menu. So right now we're looking at the total displacement overlaid on the original image. You can change the transparency value and plot it, and you can see now it's even more transparent. It's a little harder to see, so I usually keep this at about 0.6. Now, my program auto sets the color bar limits when it's plotting these contours, and so if you plot this here, uh, it'll pop up with the color bar limits in here, and if you want to change these, uh, this one's actually fine, but for some other uh, plots, you might want to change the color bar limits because the auto doesn't really do the image justice, and so what you can do is you can change it in here, and once you click enter it'll change it. and so if I just go to like 2.5 for the maximum and I press enter you can see that it replots it now with the color bar limits going between 0.85 and 2.5 and you can set this one down to zero as well and you can see that it changes the color bar limits so that's just more fine tuning and you can also note that these are lined up next to their respective contours here so if you do the Y contour and plot it you can see that it pops up here uh, and you can you know go to zero that's gonna blast it out on the on the positive side here but you can change the limits based off of which one's selected Okay, last couple things to mention here is that this just uh, gives different uh, color maps for when you're plotting. So if you want to do like grayscale, essentially, you can plot this one and it comes up as grayscale. And there's a couple other ones in here, but plasma seems to be a good one. So I default it to plasma. And the last thing that you'll see here is the threshold. And this just has to do with thresholding out vectors that are, or displacement vectors that are too big or uh, suspiciously large so that you don't get erroneous uh, displacement vectors that overshadow your boss signal. And now the last thing in this GUI that I want to show you is over here that we just skipped over before is selecting subregions. So sometimes you'll have an image that's way too big that all you care about is a smaller image and I'll show that when I go over my candle images because it'll just take too long to solve for all the stuff that you don't care about. So we can uh, enable this check mark, select a subregion, and when we do that we can click this button and it brings up a the default image and we can left click to select a top left boundary for this box and you can down, see down here it says selected top left and then we'll right click to select the bottom right boundary of the box and we'll right click and it says selected bottom right and you can keep doing this it'll just use your last two left click and right clicks and then we can click the check subregion and you, now you can see the subregion that you just selected was this red uh, rectangle and then it also plots the window and search sizes, so the window size is in dark blue and the search size is in cyan, and then you can click, you don't actually need to click the check subregion, it'll work without it anyway, and then you can click compute again, it'll run through the computations, and now if I plot the, you know, this one for instance, now you can see it only plots the region of interest that we cared about. So here I'll just go through the MATLAB code, I'm just going to run it and the GUI will pop up, and it looks similar to the Python but a little bit nicer because it's easier to make GUIs in MATLAB. We have the loading section, compute plot and post sections. I'll go through the video stuff in a second. Uh, same to how we did in Python, we'll just load the reference image, load the object image, uh, and then here I'll just go to what the Python one was, was 3264 for the window search. Uh, we have the select subregion. This subpixel resolution is available uh, to enable in MATLAB. It's not available in the Python version because it's automatically enabled, but here you have the option. Then when we press compute, it'll pop up with the image and then the window and search sizes and it asks you if you want to continue. If you say no, it just backs out and you can redo your window and search and your subregion. Uh, but if you do want to run it, then we can press yes. It'll just run through those iterations and then similar over here we can do our plotting. So we'll do the velocity vector. If I open that up, you can see that we get our uh, clockwise flow. Threshold here is the same as in Python. The interpolation factor will 
give you essentially it's smoothing the signal it has no impact on the raw boss signal that you get it just lets you smooth it a little bit that's not available in python yet this uses a jet color map but you have other options as well but the jet one generally looks pretty nice and again you can plot anything in here with the drop down menu of the xy total displacement with a certain transparency one of the bigger differences between the python and the matlab is is how the uh, post processing here is done so if i just plot the uh, this particular contour it'll pop up with the x displacement at a transparency of 0.6 and so in here what you can do is you can set the color uh, map limits in here but you can also select a region and then you click you left click the top left and you left click the bottom right and it'll auto adjust based off of the values in that region this obviously doesn't look good because I used a lot of the portion up here um, and so you can you know you can also go back and select the whole thing and it kind of resets itself but this is useful uh, if you if you have some erroneous uh, displacement vectors that are sort of large and you want to get rid of them. Okay, so what is the interp factor doing? Let me plot the total displacement. It's very pixelated because our window size is quite big. And, and so right now it's showing the values at every single window. And so if I bump this up to two, for example, and I plot it again, you can see it kind of smooths it out and you might think, oh, that's a better signal, but it's not doing anything different in the actual solution. It's just interpolating by a factor of two between the window grid points. So it's just for visualization. It's not for getting an actual better signal. If you do want an actual better signal, then just remember this plot here. Then what you want to do is enable subpixel resolution. You'll just compute again, press yes. It'll go through and run it. And then we can plot this. And now you can see that we get a, a much nicer plot. And that's actually a real change in the boss signal because you're using subpixel resolution versus just interpolating between the actual data points. Last thing that's a little bit different is when you select the subregion, we'll enable this checkbox, press compute, and this pops up with the figure. And now what you want to do is left click and drag out. And then you're going to have to right click once you've set this to whatever bounds you want. Right click and press crop image. Then it pops up with the, uh, it's hard to see on this image, but it's easier on the others. It's a dashed black box showing you the region that you selected and again the window size in green and the search size in red asks you if you want to continue if you don't you can redo this and maybe select a different region like this crop it say yes it'll run through and again you can plot the total displacement okay finally let's get back to the actual NASA images so I'm gonna load the images I'm gonna go into the frames I'll select the first frame as the background and I can select the you know, it doesn't really matter. I'm just going to scroll down and select a random frame here as the as the object. I'll leave these the same for now. I'll select a subregion and I'll use subpixel resolution. You should pretty much always be using subpixel resolution. I don't know why you wouldn't. Uh, press compute, and I don't care about the stuff up here. There shouldn't be any signal up here. So all I really care about is this region right here. Right click, crop image. Yes, it's going to run through. It's pretty quick because these are big, as you'll see. So if I'm plotting the total displacement, then you can see on here. Yeah, we're starting to get something like the shockwaves forming, but you can see that the resolution is pretty terrible because our window size and search size are so big. So what we're going to do instead is going to change the window size down to 8. I'll change this to just double that, 16, and we'll compute again. And I need to select that region, and we'll crop. And you can see now this is much smaller, so that's better. Continue, yes, it'll take a little bit longer because there's more to solve for. And then again, we'll plot here. And it looks a little dark here. There's not as much contrast, and that's where the selecting the region comes into play. So select the region, and I'll just left-click, left-click. And now you can see that we get more defined shocks in here. And, and you'll note it's still kind of grainy, and, and that's just what you're going to get with this taken off of a, a video that I, that I downloaded uh, off YouTube, essentially. And so uh, it's a little bit grainy, but you'll end up getting good results when you take images yourself. I just want to show you what happens if you don't use subpixel resolution for something like this. If you go back, uncheck that, compute, again, select a region, right click, crop, yes, it'll run through, and then you plot it, and then again, you look here. Now you can see that it looks really bad, and it looks like there's only three values, really, and that's just because the shifts are so small compared to the window size that and search size that we use that you're you might only be getting a a full pixel or two pixel shift and so the subpixel resolution gives you real signals that are smaller than the pixel shifts that that you could possibly be getting without using the subpixel resolution 
In a video I made a little while back, I looked at the boss signal from the heat from a Formula One car's engine, and I processed the data using a MATLAB code called PIVLAB, or PIVLAB. I'm using that same video uh, and just processing the frames with my code now. So what I've done is I've loaded frame 10 here, and I've loaded frame 11 here, uh, window size 8 and 16, uh, and then I'm computing and I'm selecting the region of interest, which is right here cropping and saying yes uh, and it's going to run a little bit slower just because the image has higher resolution and then I can plot here and it doesn't look too good but then I can adjust the color map by selecting this region here and now we can see the heat off of the, the back of the Formula 1 car and so that looks pretty good now we can also process with instead of doing the previous frame we can process with the first frame and again I'm selecting this region of interest here cropping saying yes it'll run through and then I'll plot again and again I will select the region and this also looks okay I selected a little bit too far and so this also looks pretty good so you'll note that those two results looked very similar either using the first frame as the reference or using the previous frame as the reference however I'm going to open up uh, a video that I process using my video code and now you can see this is processing you can see movie F1 car reference to first image this is what happens when you reference every single frame in here to the first image you can see we get build up over here and back here uh, because the trees were swaying a little bit more and so when you reference to the first image for all the successive frames uh, you'll get displacements where they shouldn't be popping up even though you do get the uh, the, the good data from from behind the car you also get this back here so if we then process and we reference to the previous one, this is what we get. Now you really only see the F1 car's engine heat and you don't see that build up here or back here. So the reason I showed you that was because it's relevant for these two settings in the video section now. You can either use the uh, background image, which I'll get into after I talk about this one, or use the previous image. So I'm using the F1 car example again, and what I've done is I've just dragged in, to make this not take too long, I've dragged in frames 8 through 14 from all those frames from that video. And so what I'm doing is I'm using the previous image as the background. And so the way that you use the video processing section is you select the video directory. Now, you don't click in, you have to select the video directory so it says it down here and press select folder. I'm using the previous image as the background because we know for this example it'll give us the best uh, results. However, not always. Then my notes here says it use, it's using the same window search and threshold and alpha as over here. So you have to make sure that you set those over here. That's just to not be redundant by putting too much extra stuff in here. So it's using 8, 16. It's using a threshold of 5 and an alpha of 0.6 for the results. Now here it's the starting frame and we have the number of frames. And you have to make sure that the starting frame is not just saying, oh, I'm starting from frame 1. It's, it has to be the number that's associated with the actual image. So again, I start from frame 8 and go to 14 so I'm gonna put in frame 8 as the starting frame and the number of frames is 7 it's not 14 it'll give you an error if you're if you go to 14 uh, and then what you do is you press compute video this is asking you to select the region now and you can see that you, you can see the car here and you can see the car here as well and that's because it's just a, a compilation essentially an overlay of all of the images that you've selected from the starting frame to the ending frame and so this just kind of shows you where to put your region of interest and so I'm making sure it covers the front one and the or the first one and the final one and then I'm going to do crop image and then you can see that it's while this button is black it's still computing the iteration is showing you here every single iteration here it's looping through the full iterations for that particular frame uh, so we have to wait a little bit longer here now you can see that it has uh, completed finished all the iterations this goes back to blue and now we can assemble the frames and so this is the color axis and so the way that I do this is uh, for a small number of images here we can just do assemble frames and you can see that it uh, opens each one up and actually my cursor is going to be in these uh, but it opens each one up and we can see that the color axis is not actually the best right now so what I can do is I can change this down to like two potentially and reassemble and it'll pop up and we can see that looks a little bit better and it's assembling the frames and then now the last thing that we can do is set the frame rate that we want to output the movie to and then the movie name I'll just call this movie out right now and then we can save the movie and this will save it to uh, the folder that you have your raw images in and so if I bring that over here you can see we just saved movie out and if I open that up now you can see it just loops over those, those frames that we saved
So the last thing I want to talk about before getting into how to set up your own experiment at home is why we'd want to use this option here. Well, I took some candle data, and you can see this data here, frames 1, 2, 3, 4, and in this case you can see this frame has no candle in place, so this is a true background. Now it's better, and you can do this yourself, it's better to reference these particular images off of this background. Now one thing you'll also note is that this says use raw underscore BG as the background, and right here we don't have any images named raw underscore BG, so this is what you get when you output from my image J macro, because it starts at image 1 and then goes to the ending image, and so what you want to do is just copy, paste, and then in here I just change this name to raw underscore bg, and if you don't have this it'll give you an error when you try to run this, but then you can run this now using this option. And so the way you'd run this is again select the video directory, click, but don't click into the folder, select it, make sure this is selected, starting frame, now I'm starting with frame 2 because the frame 1 is just my background image and I have 3 frames, so I'm going from starting from 2, number of frames 3, and then I compute the video and now I have to select a region of interest so I'm just going to pick this because nothing's happening out here and since the resolution is quite high it's going to take a longer time uh, and so I just select a smaller subregion and then it'll go through the iterations a little bit more slowly than before and then once it's done you can use the assemble frames again and you can see this popping up with the candle signal so here's the setup we have the candle on a stack of books and the lampshade in the background and this is what my uh, camera view is going to look like so if we back out here's the camera I'm just going to turn it on and then I'm going to switch to live view mode and here you can see the view that we're going to have in our video we want the sharpest focus so what I'm doing is I'm zooming in on the background in live view mode and then I'm manually adjusting the focus ring to get the sharpest background you can also do this on auto but I I like to do this on manual Because the image is a little bright, I'm just adjusting the exposure compensation down a little bit. So now we can take our video. So I first start recording, and now this is getting some background frames. Then I take my lighter, and I light the candle. And I wait a little bit for the flame to settle out. And then when I'm done, I can stop the recording, and that's our video. So I'm taking that same video that I just took, that I just showed me taking on my DSLR, and that's what's shown right here. I just renamed it Candle, and you can see it's an MOV file. And so I'm just going to go through all the steps you need uh, to go from that super simple setup uh, to a final result. And this is based off of the stuff that we talked about earlier in this video. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, shift, right click, open command window here. We're going to use FFmpeg uh, with the input of the Candle video. I'm going to use PIX format, NV12, and I'm going to use the output AVI, make sure the quality is high, and make sure the video codec is the same. Note that I, I don't need to worry about the uh, start and stop times because I'm just going to do the whole video, and I'll call this one candle.avi. It's going to go through, and you can see now it's finished and it's output the AVI file right here so we can open up image J take the AVI file drag it in uh, it's 400 uh, 547 uh, frames and so we're going to press OK open it up and so you can note that there's not a lot happening in the beginning because I'm taking some background images right now um, and so essentially what I'm going to do is just uh, what I like to do when I take videos like this is just to start at a frame like right here it's uh, it's slice 117 and we'll just do stacks tools I'm gonna go through this quick because you should know how to do this by now slice keeper I'm gonna keep 117 117 1 okay I want to change the type to 8-bit and then this one I'm going to save as a tiff out into the uh, frames folder here and I'll save this as raw BG just in case I want to make a video later now I don't need that anymore I still have the original stack right here and now what I really want is just the flame images here so I could say I really just want to keep maybe some of the interesting stuff like 385 to maybe you know 410 or something like that so I can go back in here stacks tools slice keeper uh, 385 to 410 in stacks of, or increments of one it saves it like that and then do 8-bit adjustment here it's faster if you do it on the on the kept stack because otherwise it has to go through the whole thing uh, so these are the frames that I want I'm just scrolling through to show you 
now I can use my macro, so I'm going to go to make sure this was the last window selected, and then go to Plugins, Macros, Boss, Save Sequence. I'm saving it into frames, so we can, oops, double click into frames, we're already in the frames, select that, and then there's 26 slices, so 1 to 26, increment of 1, it'll go through, and then it'll delete all those, and now we're all good, so if we go into the frames folder, you can see 1 to 26, and we also have that raw BG as well. Next, we want to go into the Python program. I'm using Python now. You can use either one. We'll run the program, and it'll pop up, and we're going to load some images in. So we're going to go into here, into frames. I'm going to use the background, and then I'm going to load another image in from here in the frames. doesn't matter. I'll just start with the first one. I'm going to decrease the size of this just because it's quite large right now. Select a subregion. Click here. So left click, and then right click, and then we'll show it. And yeah, that looks good and we're going to run the compute. Even though I can't see it down here, I know that this will be blue when it finishes. And then I'll plot total displacement, for example. In here, it doesn't look like much, but then we can change this and maybe go down to 1, I think, or even lower, maybe even like 0.5, for example. I mean, that's a little bit too low. Uh, 0.75, for example. And there you go. That is really all it takes to get a boss signal uh, from a quick setup. I mean, from start to finish, that might have been like five minutes. I just want to point out that in that example I did not have to do image registration in ImageJ because I made sure that my camera was on a tripod so the background was not moving uh, from the background to the to the object images that I cared about. So if you can try to make sure that your camera is on a tripod or at least fixed to something so it's not moving. These are just some of the other setups that I've used in my document. So here is one where, where I'm using the chair as a background and I'm using the blow dryer. I've also uh, draped my blanket over the chair to use as the background. Uh, in this example, you can see I'm using my DSLR with a candle with the chair as the background. And then this other example, you can see I'm using the lampshade with my DSLR and a tripod, and I'm putting in a mug of tea. So now I just want to make a quick note about the displacements that you see in these plots. I'm going to plot, I'm using some candle data from before, and I'm going to plot the X contour. So if I plot this here, it's a little dim, so I'm going to adjust these uh, limits here to something like this. And so now you can see that uh, we have on the left hand side we have the positive values, on the right hand side here of the candle we have negative values, and this is just saying uh, because this is the X displacement plot, it's saying that in these pixels over here, the pixels have been displaced in the direction of the positive X axis, so they're, they're actually shifting in. And then over here they're shifting left, so they're shifting this way. And then you can see in here, if I sort of zoom in, now in here there's very little gradient because it's kind of it's kind of coming over a hump in here and so it should be the same color as the background which is what you see right in the center of the flame now if I switch this over to the Y contour this is why this is such a good example problem is that even if I shift this down to you know limits that are more reasonable like the other one everything looks the same and that's because you don't have any gradients in the Y direction the gradients from a laminar candle that are oriented in this direction are only going to be in the X direction so you have nothing showing up for the Y displacement plot now when you plot the total displacement however now it looks similar to the X displacement but you'll notice that we don't have any go anything going from negative to positive and that's because of the way that the total displacement is defined and again that is it's it's the square root of the uh, some of the squares of the X and the Y displacement so it's the norm of the of the X and Y displacements and so really what it goes from is negative it can't, or zero it can't be a negative number up to something and so in this case again we'll just adjust it to something a little bit more reasonable and so in this case the background should be zero. It should have no displacement, so that's just showing zero. And then in the flame, it'll be on both the left and the right side, even though the left side is actually getting shifted to the right and the right side is getting shifted shifted to the left. Uh, you'll see that it's about the same magnitude, which again you would expect in a laminar flame. So I mentioned the threshold before, and you can sort of just leave that at five. It generally works for pretty much everything. Uh, but one thing that's nice about it is that it provides sort of an automatic masking. Uh, you can see in this uh, plot where I've run this with the threshold of five and if you just zoom in here you can see that the the candle is shown here and it sort of already masks the candle automatically now if I bump this threshold up to something higher so a larger threshold than you would get from the window in the search sizes and I plot this again now you can see that it doesn't really mask it out down here it has these large vectors you can see going up to like 15 right in the center here and those are just erroneous so the thresholding provides a, a nice arbitrary masking that you don't have to worry about 
Now, this video is already quite long as it is, so what I'm going to do is point you to my PDF document that I'll be posting with a link in the description. And this goes through some different combinations of objects, backgrounds, and cameras. And you can see I've also used my phone, and it does have good results. And also a few studies talking about pixel versus subpixel resolution, distance between the object and the background, F number changes on the camera, image interpolation, and a more advanced code than mine. And so you can see here I've uh, showing you the candle, the lighter, the blow dryer, and the, the mug of tea, and then also the different backgrounds that I've used uh, along with the two cameras that I've been using. And you can see some examples, and I'm showing them generally for both the Python and the MATLAB code. Uh, for example, this is the candle with the lampshade and my phone, and you can see it's actually quite good. I'm also showing the a lighter now with the lampshade. You can see the blow dryer with a blanket. You can see the tea with a lampshade. Uh, and then I go into some of the details uh, about, you know, where do you want to put your your object in reference to the background. And so you can see I have my camera, a candle on a tripod, and then the, the chair that I use as the background. And I show you the results as well. I also do an F number change so you can see how the uh, candle gets blurry versus sharp depending on the F number you're using and also the, re the results that you get. Uh, some interpolation that I had mentioned before, and then a more advanced code. So I hope that this video has potentially inspired you to try this out at home. If you do and you post something on YouTube, feel free to link to it in a comment uh, so others can see what you've done. Thanks for sticking it out this long, and good luck, and thanks for watching.